for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thursday afternoon, December 29, 1977. Midwinter camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp, Hot Springs, Arkansas. This tape is tape two of Winworley's uh, message of the afternoon, and this tape is questions and answers. Should this for any reason be defective, please explain and return for replacement. I'm not just crying wolf, friends. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> now, why'd you have to ask me that? <laughs> now, I didn't do this, but some of my bird dogs did back there in Hagwood. The Star of David, if you go to the Encyclopedia Botanica or any encyclopedia and look it up, you'll find out it's an ancient witchcraft symbol. It's, 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 it's an occult symbol. Well, paint it, paint it over and, and dedicate it to Jesus and oil it good. <laughs> Soft rock, too. In Acts, the seventh chapter, in verse 42, it says, God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. There is no such thing as a star of David in the Bible. It's this star right here. I collared a fellow in Israel in a shop where they were selling these Bibles with so-called stars of David upon him, and I made that man admit that that was a heathen god, and he finally came to it and admitted it. It was not a star of David. But he said it's good for sales. Acts, the seventh chapter, verses 42 and 43. I'd have probably found that if I'd looked for it. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Ferris. Uh, you see, the devil has worked a real shenanigan to slip up on our blind side, and he slipped all kinds of religious doodads in on us. And if it's a religious, it couldn't be wrong, could it? We have to be careful. We need to re-examine and look for the Scriptures. The lady mentioned rock music. That's right down at the bottom of this. It's all occult. The beat, the syncopated beat of rock music, comes directly out of voodoo and all the Eastern religions. And anybody who gets involved in it, rock music is made to be felt, not just heard. It's a shattering experience. And our kids are full of demons today because of the rock. I'll tell you another little interesting thing that might you might not know. Usually on these complicated stereophonic records they're making now, they run about 32 tapes to record the music. And you, you thought, well, good grief, I never... It sounded to me like it's all run together. Well, that's the way it sounds, but uh, you're not demonically selective, you see. And on one of those tracks, nearly all the best-known rock groups are open Satan worshipers. Homosexuals, bisexuals, you have whatever you, you name it. They're openly this way. They brag about it. It's even on their albums. And uh, they, well, kiss, for instance, Satan worshipers, one of the top groups right now. And most of the other leading groups, they're homosexual. They are Satan worshipers, open Satan worshipers. Their covers have witchcraft symbols on them and everything else. Now, on most of these albums that have 32 tracks, on one of those tapes, at the sub-audio level, below the level that you can hear with a natural ear, they have somebody on there who chants over and over again, Satan is king. Worship Satan. Lucifer is great. Lucifer is God. And things of this sort. Satanic chants. Now, when you listen to the record, you can't hear it with your natural ear. But your subconscious picks it up, just like the, sub, the subliminal advertising. Uh, these, um, well, I better not get into that. 
I better stay closer to this. All right. The subliminal advertising. Oh, boy, that's something else. We're being set up for the Antichrist, people. With TV, with magazines, and everything. Well, just an example. These beautiful waterfalls, you see cool cigarettes. If you look real closely, there's a naked woman taking a shower in that. In that waterfall. She's been airbrushed in. That beautiful nature scene. There's sex written all over the advertisements that we read. Even Ma Bell got into it with a little baby with sex written all over its clothes. They're triggering all kinds of things in us. We don't even know what's going on. You better get your guards up, friend. The enemy has overlooked no way to attack. He's attacking on every front. And he's most effective when we don't know that's what he's doing. I Ching, Herr Krishna, kids who listen to my sweet Lord are full of Herr Krishna spirits. I've never seen one yet that listened very much to that my, my sweet Lord record that doesn't have a Herr Krishna spirit as big as a horse. I'd say, okay, Herr Krishna, come out of there. Leave me alone, Whirly. He's there. Because the uh, My Sweet Lord that the Beatles wrote is a, a, a worship song to Herr Krishna, a demon god of India. I'll tell you another little secret. Most of the incense in this country is made by the Herr Krishna worshippers and is dedicated to him. And you burn it in your house and you get something you didn't expect. You get something besides sweet odor. I'd throw it out if I were you. Get you some spray or something if you want something to smell sweet. I wouldn't burn incense. I've gotten real skittish about it. We used to, every time incense came to our house, our kids got sick. So we realized what was happening. Of course, rock music, mind control, occult spirits all. If you have come in contact with any of these spirits, or with other related occult things. There are two steps to getting free. Many people have taken the first step. Well, you've got to forsake it, confess it as sin to the Lord. And many people have done this. But did you know something? If that's as far as you've gone, the devil still has a legal hold on you. In the Bible, they destroyed all the books of magic and things of that sort. They burned it. Don't give it to somebody else. No, he's giving a curse to somebody else, is there? You need to confess it and forsake it, but you also must close the door to Satan or else he still has a legal right to come and go through that door because you or somebody in your family opened that door. Some of you say, well, I never fool with that stuff. How about your ancestors back four generations? Let's see, that would be grandma, Great-grandma, great-great-grandparents. How many of you know anything about your great-great-grandparents? Very few. We don't know what they got messed up in, do we? Seventy-two ancestors involved. I'd have probably figured that out. Wouldn't I? <laughs> there's 72 of them. You get, you, there's 72 roads that the devil could have come in to zero in on your life. You think he's overlooked any opportunity? Isn't it better to close those doors? I can show you how. It's not that difficult. First of all, the first step is to confess. So if you've been involved in this, you want to take part, just to be sure, let's go through it. You think about all the things that you've touched in the occult. Okay? Yes, be careful what you buy in a garage sale. Dedicate it to the Lord if you bring it in. Now, you don't tell them what it's been in. Yes, ma'am. Indian jewelry, be very careful of it. Playing cards, yes. No witch would be without a deck of playing cards because they were originally designed to tell fortunes with. All Indian jewelry made by any Indian tribe has in it, in the design, a design to a cult god. Did you hear that? The Indian designs. The only place you're safe is to get it from Jay back here, and he, he ain't no Indian, and he, he's not going to be designing anything into it that's a cult. <laughs> yes. You better watch souvenirs from any place where there are heathen people, heathen craftsmen. Africa or the East. Let me mention this, because some people, this may be all new to you, and you may think, well, they've just gone completely haywire. Let me take you back to the Old Testament. You remember when they were wandering in the wilderness, and they had all the elements to make the temple and the tabernacle and all its furnishings? Remember? That? And the Bible said that God gave to certain people skills to weave, to carve and make cunning uh, engravings on gold and silver, precious stones, that God gave them the talent to do this. Now, demon worship 
people, very often the craftsmen offer their hands to the demon god and dedicate them to that. And they in return are given cunning skills to fashion some of the most beautiful designs you ever saw. But it is done by hands that are dedicated to a demon and they are, they are doing this as a worship to that god. And when you put it in your house, the little Mexican sun god, or the, uh, the little uh, Buddhas or whatever, you're taking an awful chance. I wouldn't do it. It's just not worth it. Let's put it this way. There may be some innocent ones on the market. I'm not saying they're not. And I don't want to go into a witch hunt and have everybody all scared to death and all this. But if I were you, I'd be very careful what I put in my house. Because you can bring... If you think I'm joking, pick up that book back there, Are Demons for Real? by John uh, Peterson, uh, Robert Peterson. It's a very excellent book. He's a missionary to Barneo. And read what happened to him when he picked up some curios for his missionary furlough trip. And his son started having nightmares. And they couldn't figure out what was the matter. And it came back to some curios and how sickness and everything else comes onto a house. When even pictures in Barneo, when somebody gets saved, then the, the people are too poor to have images. So they'll, ha they'll buy pictures of the demon and paste them on their walls. But when a person gets saved, they scrape the pictures off and even wash the glue or the paste off the walls before they're through. It's even dangerous to leave paste on the walls that the pictures are stuck with. Now, that may sound extreme to you, but I'm telling you, this stuff is powerful. It's not just play, play toys. Yes, sir? Well, that eye on the pyramid has nothing to do with God. Neither does the pyramid. That's all wrapped up in the occult and in the Illuminati. Get a hold of Pat Brooks' book, The Return of the Puritans. Because all hell's broken loose around that woman and her household since she wrote that book two years ago. She's the lady that wrote out in the name of Jesus. Yes. Is it a double triangle? That may, that may be all it is. Why don't you pray and ask the Lord what to do about it? And the, Lord, the Lord can tell his people what to do. Uh, some of these things you can't get rid of because they belong to somebody else. Anoint them with oil. And dedicate them to Jesus and curse the demon in them. Yeah. Frogs and owls are things of the night. Be careful. Pray about it. But isn't it strange that frogs and owls have become so prominent with the occult revolution? They're on everything. This lady over here has had her hand up for a while. Excuse me. It was called a Mary, what was called a Mary spirit. And uh, when that was uh, called out, it was just like my mind was in a vice, my head. I, you know, I thought up until that time it was kind of foolish that people didn't really have to scream when these things came out. But I had absolutely no control over my screaming. And it was just like my head was just like in a vice. And I grabbed my head, uh, you know, with my two hands, and I just screamed and screamed and screamed. And so, uh, I'm sure, I mean, I had something there. <laughs> and uh, I don't know where it fits in with all this uh, cult and all that. But. Well, Mariolatry is definitely a spirit. It's one of the most obscene spirits I've ever dealt with in my life, the filthiest things I've ever heard said by demons have come out of the spirit of Mariolatry, cursed us out and said, bow down and worship me, you blankety-blank clogs of dirt. I'm the mother of God. And uh, it's always a very obscene spirit. And uh, what more can I say? It's a spirit, that's all. Yes. I, I don't class that as magic myself. To me, it's just dexterity of the hands. In my thinking, now, you ask me my opinion. Uh, magic has to do with more than that. Magic is really making something happen that shouldn't. Return to the owls. All right. The owls are creatures of the night and frogs. Frank and Ida Mae Hammonds have warned against those in their book, Pigs in the Parlor. I think we'd be well advised to heed their admonition to be careful. I think you could get along without owls and frogs in your house. Cats, uh, cats are often used by witches as familiars. And some people have an uneasy feeling about cats. I guess that would be a matter of personal preference. I don't know. I don't know of any specific f prohibitions about them. But they, yeah, they worship the cat. Mm -hmm. 
Well, cats are often used. Cats are peculiar creatures, and uh, they, uh, of course, dogs aren't spoken of too highly either. <laughs> so now we've got all the animal lovers on the warpath. People didn't tell us about the owls. What's behind the owls? Well, the, the owls, um, now I've, I've, I've heard... I've I've heard this story, and I can't confirm this. I have reason to wonder about my source. Well, the reason I hesitate a little bit. Uh, but let's just need needless to say that. I mean that man's been discredited, and so I would rather wait until I check it from another source before I use it. Uh, the owl and the frog are often involved in creatures of the night. There are reasons why God calls certain animals and birds unclean. It may well be because they are most easily inhabited by demon spirits. And you notice I say it may well be. I can't say for sure. I haven't dissected them to find them. But I know there's a reason why God made certain animals and birds unclean. So you can now send you to your Bible to see which one that is and how come. But there is always a reason for what God says. All right. Now, let's move back and let's renounce this stuff and let's get it out, okay? First, we're going to confess it as sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the first step to getting things right is always to get things right with God, to be sure that it's under the blood, to be sure it's been confessed to the Lord as sin. And any occult contact... Or anything you suspect you may have contacted should be put under the blood by confession. So if you'd just bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, I come to you and I confess that in the past, through ignorance, through curiosity, and sometimes through stubborn willfulness, I have come in contact with certain occult things. I now recognize this as to being sin, and I do repent, and I confess it as sin, and claim forgiveness. In particular, I confess contact with the following occult things. Now, you mention to the Lord the things that you can remember from a child on up that you have come in contact with. In connection with levitation, don't forget table tipping. I do confess all these things as sin. And claim your forgiveness, Lord. I also claim forgiveness for any other occult contacts that I do not know about. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now then we're going to do the second step, which is just as critical, to close the door to Satan. We're going to address Satan, and you never go against him unprotected. Repeat after me, please. Satan, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And I'm closing any door that I may have opened to you through contact with the following occult things. Now, you tell Satan again all the things you just mentioned to the Lord for forgiveness. And if you think of an extra one, put it in. I renounce all the things I know about and the things I don't know about in the name of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, there's a couple more things that need to be covered. Just repeat after me, please. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
I now renounce, break and loose myself from all demonic subjection to my mother, father, grandparents, or any other human beings, living or dead, that has ever been in the past or is now dominating me or controlling me in any way contrary to the will of God. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. I also repent and ask you to forgive me if I have ever dominated or controlled anyone the wrong way. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now renounce, break and loose myself from all and all our children, from all psychic heredity, demonic holes, psychic powers, bondages, bonds of physical or mental illness, or curses upon me or my family line as a result of sins, transgressions, iniquities, occult or psychic involvements of myself, my parents, or any of my ancestors, of my spouse, any and all ex-spouses, or their parents, or any of their ancestors. I thank you, Lord, for setting me free. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now rebuke, break and loose myself and all my children from any and all evil curses, charms, vexes, hexes, spells, Jinxes, Jinxes, psychic powers, powers, bewitchments, bewitchments, witchcraft, witchcraft, or sorcery sorcery that have been put upon me me, or my family line line, by any person person, or persons persons, or from some occult source or or occult or psychic source. And I command all connected and related spirits to leave me. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Now, as strange as that may seem to you, if it's new, legally, you have just severed connections with many legal holes and legal bonds. It does not necessarily take this enemy out, but now he has no ground to stand on and he stands exposed and open to attack. A curse or any legal hole stands like a fence to protect his position. This is why I wanted to take you through this, because if you've never been through it, now you are freer than you have been before. Legally, the devil hadn't got a leg to stand on. Now, don't open the door anymore. Now, Brother Glenn suggested there might be uh, someone ask questions, and so if Brother Carroll will come and Brother Ferris will let you fire at us. And uh, I know most everything, but what I don't know, they do. Come on, fellas. Now, seriously, we'd be glad to try to field your questions the best we know how. Yes, sir. (laughs) 
But um, I don't know if many parents are aware of it, but we have, we have had to deal with, deal with some young people in the areas of, of deliverance who play, um, play a game in school, particularly, called Mary Word. I don't know if any of the parents are aware of it. Mary Word. Public school or not public school? No, it's public school. Public school and public school, both places. Yeah. They, they, they Tell them briefly how it works, John. Well, one, one variation to this is that the kids go into the bathroom and look into the mirror and call on Mary Mary. And she appears. And she appears. Now, this one particular lady, um, who was our fellowship for ministry, she did not use the name Mary Mary, she used the name Jamie. And she called on Jamie. And it was when, when she was in about fourth grade, and I, that, it, that it, this spirit entered into her, and from that time she had strong suicidal tendencies. When she came to her hand, it was all cut up with knives at her, where she had attempt, attempted just, just to cut her vein, and she had attempted to kill her too. Mm -hmm. And well, um, her mother had just learned about deliverance and, and, and voted her up and ministered to her. And, and that day she was beautiful, beautifully delivered, received the baptism in the spirit. But the thing is, there are many parents who are not aware of the games that the kids play, be it if they go to some church somewhere, you know, they play it in church or they play it in school. And I think you want to be fully aware of these things. And this is just one example of one of the things that's very, very dangerous. Yes. Thank you, John. And another thing that I might ought to mention, if you parents are not aware of it, at the slumber parties and things of this sort, many times they play levitation and seance, too. Somebody have a question or another comment, maybe? Uh, uh, Brother, uh, hey, uh, well, the uh, demon is cast out, and, and your house is swept clean. You see, you see what I'm getting at? He goes back and says, oh, this house is swept clean. But as the demon goes out, there's a bathroom there. What, what, what's the next step to fill this? Brother Worley probably would have thought of this. Okay. Number one, believe and do what God's Word says. That's Mark 11. 22 through 26. When you come to the word mountain in the scriptures, you always equate that word. Now, this is just a thought. You always equate that with governments. Satan has kingdoms. He has a government. He has a plan and a purpose. And the whole thing ends up in death. He means business. So when the word says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, the sea and the bottomless pit are equated in the Scriptures. You shall not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say shall come to pass. You, it'll come to pass. You'll have what you say. The mountains are the principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. All right, now, that's number one. Number two, submit yourself to God. James 4, 7, and 1 Peter 5, 6. Number three, Resist the devil. That's James 4, 7. 4. Worship the Lord in the Spirit every day. That's important. Don't wait to come to the church and the congregation, you know, just to speak in tongues and praise God. Praise the Lord before you ever get out of bed. Amen. Speak in the Spirit. Amen. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Amen. Glory to God. Worship the Lord. In spirit. That's John 4, 24. The Lord is seeking such to worship Him. All right? Now, number five, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5 through 18. God has made provisions for that in, the, in, in 19, 20, and 21. That's verses 19, 20, and 21. He's made provisions by we can speak to ourselves in songs, spiritual songs and hymns, you know, and make, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. The second part of that is to give thanks unto God for all things. And the fourth thing is, is to submit yourself to one another in the fear of the Lord. Six, pray, well, I've already done that, pray in the Spirit. <laughs> Number six, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. That's Ephesians 5, uh, 6, 11 through 18. Now that's how you can maintain your deliverance. Praise be unto God, because that Spirit... Is, is an earthbound thing. And it goes out and walks around, according to Matt, or Luke, the 11th chapter, it goes out and it walks around in the dry places. 
and then it says I'm going to go back, and it claims ownership, and it has a right, a legal right, if that house hasn't been filled with God. Hallelujah. More. Yes, amen. Uh, along that same line, uh, we have found that when we're through praying with somebody for deliverance, we turn around and ask the Holy Spirit to fill every area that's been vacated so that there's no vacated place in that person for a demon power to have a right to unless that person then would have to turn around and reopen their self up all over again to have, so there would be a right to come back. But if that area is taken over by the Holy Spirit, it now belongs to God, and there's no vacant place there for seven other demons to come back into because it's filled. And there's no place. Another thing that we believe in as much as possible when there's a deliverance service is over, to have a time of praise and worship, that the joy of the Lord will be our portion. And we're there to praise and worship the Lord, that Satan will get no glory Amen. from the show he put on. Yes. Amen. Yes, this is... Go ahead, excuse me. One other thing, while well, Brother Glenn was saying, don't forget to pray for the healing as you pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord will also heal all the places that the demons have left because they try to tear at places inside the body and uh, the throat and so forth and pray for the Holy Spirit not only to fill but to heal and repair the damages that the demons have done and they're leaving. Praise be unto God. This, uh, uh, this thought that Brother Glenn just brought out that in the worship or in the service itself after the deliverance has, has become effective and the persons are delivered I just magnify the fact that we began to praise and worship the Lord and just lift Him up and let, and let the very atmosphere of the, of the whole congregation or the church and the congregation be filled with the glory of God. It's necessary not only for you but also for those people that have just been delivered. Listen, they've come through a terrible thing, and they need our help and our assistance and that strength right at that particular time. Bah. <laughs> Halloween, of course, is a, is a celebration of the satanic forces. We should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. And Santa Claus, of course, is a jolly old elf, and you know what an elf is, don't you? Elves and fairies are nothing but the uh, manifestations of demons that have been written down, the leprechauns and all this sort of thing. Those are the People have seen those things. And those are not really for us, are they? Brother Worley, I might make this comment that in school, of course, your kids in public school and this and that, uh, you have a lot of pressure on you from their peer group, you know, to participate in these uh, particular events. Uh, Halloween surely is a, a lot of pressure put on you. And uh, in our church, in our fellowship, what we have done, we have an All Saints party. And uh, we call it an All Saints party. Well, our people come dressed up like a Bible character. And we've had Moses there, and we've had Samuel there, and John the Baptist. And uh, then we, we make it a real time of worship and glorifying the Lord. And our, our kids uh, enjoy this. And not only our kids, but uh, I enjoy it too, you know. And this is something to glorify the Lord Jesus. Brother Ballard. Although I've worked in deliverance for about eight years, only within the last four months have we really started stressing it in our congregation. Uh, and just before I left, I had a sister call me, and she had been plagued for several nights, waking up with what she could only describe as being stuck with pins. And she had began praying, and God began to reveal <coughs> that voodoo was being used against her. Uh, my question is. How do we deal with this? Because this is a, an out, this is an attack of Satan from the outside rather than from the inside out. First of all, you get over in the Psalms and you claim the Scripture that says you can send a curse back. That those who love cursing, 109th Psalm, isn't it? Uh, you can send a curse and let those that love cursing receive it again unto themselves. Wad that thing up, triple its power and fasten it on the one that sent them. They need it. I usually, we, we got in a battle with the witchcraft coven up in Chicago that was trying to send, uh, we, there was a Satan worshiper coming to the church, a converted Satan worshiper. 
she'd been into all kinds of stuff. And they kept flinging curses against her. And I got so aggravated with them having to pull those things off of her. So finally, they had imported an idol from India. The Satan worshippers had had it brought over from India and it had a spirit of, what was it? I, I don't even remember what it was. Insanity was bound up in this idol. And they had gathered around this covenant, gathered around. This all came out in the deliverance session. They had pulled that, de- that demon out of this idol and flung it against this woman, insanity. And she came forward with a splitting headache and uh, said, Would you pray for me? My head is just splitting all during the service. And I said, Well, sure, Lou. And I laid hands on her. And I said, In the name of Jesus, I rebuke every spirit that's causing this. And a deep bass voice came out of her said, Get your blankety blank hands off me, Whirly. And jerked back. And then she, all, she knocked down three men in the aisle trying to stop her from getting out. And they finally got a hold of her and brought her back up. And we went into a long tussle with that thing. And finally we got it bulldogged. And then uh, he was giving up, and he said, I give up, I'll leave. And I said, not yet. And he looked very frightened, and he said, what are you up to, Worley? I said, well, I have something in mind. So I took him through all the confessions I could, under, I could remember about Jesus was his Lord and a few things like that that humiliated him and rubbed his nose in the dirt real good. And when he was completely broken then and begging to leave, I made him promise to go and attack the coven that had sent him. He didn't want to, but it was the only way he could get away from me, so he decided he would do it. The last I heard, uh, we heard of three members of the coven. One of them was running across country. The cops were chasing him. One woman got sick, was in bed four days, couldn't get out of bed. And I don't know, because he was very angry with the coven, because he said they had put him in there with an uh, irrevocable curse. And I said, I've got news for you. I'm revoking that curse. And when it was broken, he was furious with that coven. And so, really, when they're thwarted in doing what they're supposed to, they're very angry. And if you can just wring that thing out and throw it back on the people that sent it, it'll teach them not to send them. I usually ask the Lord to bind it onto them with the blood of Jesus. Because I reason that the only way they can get out from under is to come to the Lord. That'd be great, wouldn't it? I'd just like to uh, <clears throat> speak to this thing on Halloween and Santa Claus, again, according to the Scriptures. Uh, in Second Timothy, the fourth chapter, Paul exhorted Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the, the alive and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, to preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own loss will they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they will turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Halloween and Santa Claus are fables. And people like to hear that. Yes, Easter time, all the rest of these things. I believe that we should bring up our children on the Word of God. On the Word of God itself. And teach and preach that. And, And yes, don't lie to the children. That's a lying spirit that takes effect in that. And also in this very same area that brother, the brother was speaking to about the woman being poked with pens, a few years ago down in Chichi Castananga in Guatemala, I walked into a Catholic church where a witch doctor was practicing right in the front of the church in Chichi Castananga. He happened to be the head witch doctor. I didn't know it, but he happened to be the head witch doctor. He was sitting at a table, and he had little corn cob, or not, not corn cob, but corn husk dolls that were made up, and they had bits of paper and hair and all kinds of things made up, and he was sticking silver swords through these dolls. I didn't know it at the time, but he was doing that as people had come in. These Indians had paid him to stick these things in there to curse someone else. In Proverbs, the 26th chapter, in the first couple of verses, I think it's the second or third verse, it says, The cursed causeless shall not come. There's always a cause for it. Now, it's sin itself where we have missed the mark. Now, I myself thought that I could not be touched by a curse. Now, this was years ago. Now, believe me, I know there's some people sitting right here that feel the same way, perhaps. And then there's others of you that have had your eyes opened up, and you will have them opened up in just a moment. In Proverbs, the 16th chapter, it talks about the fact that pride goeth before destruction. You can be puffed up in your knowledge. And the devil likes nothing more than if he can't hold you back to give you a good push. 
and get you out there in presumption until where it gets dominion over the top of you. Now listen, without even asking God, I took those witch doctors on right there. They were pouring whiskey oblations. They were burning hundreds and hundreds of candles right in the aisles. And all at once, I, this man gave some kind of a signal, and all these witch doctors took me on. And I had about a hundred witch doctors that were taking incense cans, and they were throwing, flipping those things around me, and they were speaking some kind of chants and singing in chants as they were whirling these things around my head. And I'm telling you, that smoke and stuff got up my nostrils till I was choking so bad I couldn't breathe. And I'll tell you, they followed me right out of the city of Chichi Costananga. I got on an aircraft. We, we went over to Jerry Owens and Jerry and Sandy Owens where we were staying in Guatemala City. And I got on an aircraft and came back to the States. We got back and I started feeling sick. And I was rebuking the devil going along there. I started feeling sick. I got up to my home in, when we were living at, at Muncie, Indiana at that particular time. I went to bed, and I got up in the morning, and I'll tell you, when I walked past our vanity and I looked in that mirror, I was as green as a sweater. Every bit of me, fingernails, eyeballs, everything. My eyes were green. I was green all over. I mean, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I thought something was wrong with our lighting or something had gone haywire with my eyes. And I said, Audrey, get in here quick. And she come in there, she says, my land, you're green. I said, I know it. I said, what the world do you think it is? I said, and she says, I don't know. And I'll tell you, I began, I, I just got weak. I just got weak as a rag. And I didn't know what was wrong. And I lay down on the bed, and the telephone rang in a little while, and it was a friend of mine, Johnny Isles, from Ciudad, Victoria. He's been a missionary down in, in uh, old Mexico for years. And he was calling from the Muncie airport. Uh, so he says, come on out and pick us up, Ferris. And I said, well, okay. So I'm, I wanted to get up, you know, and continue to move on in faith. And so here I was, as green as grass and weak as a rag, and I got in that automobile with my wife, and we went out to the airport. When John saw me, he, saw, he said, Ferris, what in the world has happened to you? I said, man, John, I don't know. I said, I just woke up this morning, and I'm just weak as a rag. He said, Ferris, he said, did you have any witch doctors around you when you were in Guatemala? That's the first thing he asked. I said, well, yes, I did, and I told him what had happened. He says, brother, they've got a curse on you. Why, I says, how could that be? I said, they couldn't put a curse on me. I said, I moved in there in the name of Jesus. He said, brother, he said, they got a curse on you. And he began to, well, we went over to the house, and I went back in the bedroom, and I lay down, and I could hear him and his wife, or hear my, him and he and my wife out in the hallway pacing up, and John was getting more furious by the minute. I'd called for the elders of the church, and they were on their way up from Indianapolis with a carload of men to come up there and pray. And about the time they got in the yard, John come bursting in through that bedroom door, my wife right behind him. And I'm telling you, they were binding those spirits and binding that curse and casting that thing off of me in the name of Jesus. And I'll tell you, I felt that thing leave my body. I felt it leave my body. And by the time those elders got in the house and laid hands on me and prayed, uh, prayed over the top of me right in my bed, I got up by faith and walked out there with them, and God took that curse off of me. You know what else he took off me? Sin. If you call for the elders of the church, God will only raise you up through the prayer of faith, but he'll also forgive you that sin. Amen. He took that sin off me. And the Lord showed me. He said, Ferris, if I would have wanted you to go in there, he said it would have been a different thing. But he says, I am judging those people. And he says, that's Satan's seat. And he says, their judgment isn't yet. He says, you presumed it. It was presumption, brother and sister, that I was in, even though I thought I was doing the right thing. <laughs> Praise God. It says the Spirit ex speaketh expressly that in the latter times, you know any latter times in this? Does anybody? This is the latest hour I know of. In the latter times, it says, Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. The word seducing is plano, and it means a spirit that causes you to wander off the path. A wandering spirit and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
forbidding to marry and, co and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now, I truly believe that with all my heart. Just about all the health food nuts that I know are the most unhealthy people I've ever looked at. I went into a health food store out in McAllen, Texas, and this woman asked me, she says, How old do you think I am? And I said, Well, you look about 70. She was really insulted because she was only 40. I've never guessed. <laughs> the master of tact. Right. But I will say this, that I do believe within my heart that we can pray and ask the Lord what foods we should eat and what foods that we shouldn't eat. Praise be unto God. Now, I'll say this to you. I have never had any problem with eating pork over the years. We've eaten a lot of pork. We were on a farm. I was raised on a farm up in Michigan, and we always had our, our pork, and, and we smoked it and, and uh, took care of it, you know, and, and we took care of all those things. But my wife has been unable to eat pork. Every time she eats pork, her body will just swell right up. We quit eating it. We just stopped eating pork altogether. And I'm not telling people to abstain from meat. I'm not at all. But I feel within my own heart that it's only judge, uh, right, uh, uh, it's only common sense. It's just, it's just a good sound mind not to eat that kind of thing because it was affecting my wife in a wrong way. Praise be unto God. So we leave it alone. Now we don't get into a place where the, we happen to walk in and the, we happen to walk into Glenn and Irma's house and find them with a great big ham there. I'm not going to make a great big scene out of it and say, oh, my land, there's the uh, abomination of desolation. Yeah, send it down to McCarroll's trailer, he says. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know that. But I'm saying you can carry that thing to the extreme of where that you're almost, it's almost as if that it's become the God to you. Anything can be done. Yes, amen. Reach over and take somebody by the hand and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Praise God. Praise God. Father, we thank you for the sweet fellowship that you've given to us here. Lord, for the many acquaintances that we've made, brothers and sisters in Christ. Those that we have renewed, Lord, how sweet it is. Father, we pray as we dismiss at this time until the evening service in just a little while that your hand will rest heavily upon us. Lord, bring those tonight who have needs in their heart, needs that they need to have met, and only you can meet them. Father, I pray that you'll satisfy every hungering heart with the, the, the Word of God by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Father, we know there's people who've come to be set free. And Lord, we trust that you will set them free this night for the glory of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.